So it's the last day of the summit. I hope everyone's had a really good time, and, um, and I hope people aren't a bit sleepy. <laughs> we'll, we'll, try and, uh, we'll try and liven things up as much as we can. Um, we've been talking at a number of conferences over the years. Um, we've, we've done sessions on how we designed our OpenStack Cloud, how we built our OpenStack Cloud, um, how we moved all our workloads um, so that we have all of our, pretty much all of our workloads running on our OpenStack Cloud. Um, and this is possibly the least glamorous of all the talks, but this is how we're maintaining it, running it, upgrading it, um, keeping the lights on. Um, it feels a bit like the, the fourth of a trilogy, to quote Douglas Adams. Um, so it's the day-to-day. -day. There, there isn't going to be anything new, anything earth-shattering, any new technologies, but it is going to be our experiences of what you should and shouldn't do when you're running a large um, OpenStack cloud with over 100,000 cores and all your production workloads on it. Uh, a little bit about us. Um, so Paddy Power Betfair formed 2015 from the merger of two online um, gaming companies, uh, both with similar business models in the sportsbook betting space. Betfair also has an exchange offering which allows peer-to-peer um, -peer betting with a, an open API. Um, the API generates a large amount of traffic. We don't throttle it at all. It's where our customers are based. It's where our revenue comes from, so we try to encourage as much access as possible. This brings a certain amount of scale challenges, a certain amount of timeline challenges. There's a whole sequencing issue as well to be managed on the exchange. It isn't like Twitter. It's key important that things happen in the right order. Um, it is financial. I mean, it's not financial services, but it is still people's money, quite large sums of money at any given time, and it needs to be transactionally safe. We are a heavily regulated industry, as, you, as I can imagine you, you'd understand. Um, so we have a number of constraints from gambling regulators across the EU particularly, but also overseas more and more now in the, the um, US states getting involved. We have a number of other brands, just to go through quickly, um, FanDuel, TVG and Draft in the US, uh, Timeform, who produce data to enable more informed betting, and Sportsbet, which is our, our Australian operation. The primary focus of our OpenStack Cloud is the Paddy Power Betfair brands, however. Uh, pretty much everything you see uh, on Paddy Power Betfair is, using, is running on OpenStack. Um, so a little bit about us individually. Yeah, so I'm Adrian Miron. Um, I used to be DevOps in our company for four years. Uh, after that, I decided to move in infrastructure part, uh, becoming a senior infrastructure engineering manager. Um, and again, we help uh, Thomas teams to keep the lights on and uh, give operational excellence to our infrastructure. Um, and yeah, I hand over this one to Thomas. Back to me. <laughs> So I was a developer, I joined Betfair in um, 2006. I've been a developer, I've, I've run the software development teams on the, on the exchange. I then spent a while moving the workloads onto, onto our cloud, uh, and my current role is um, head of cloud automation, which is effectively both automating our OpenStack cloud and all our CI, CD pipelines and tooling for all the software development teams. Our teams are in um, four locations. We have, or well, primarily four locations, but in, in Ireland, in the UK, in, in Porto, and in Romania, in Cluj. So we, it's a distributed thing. We have teams supporting the software engineers. We have about five, 600 software engineers continuously pushing um, deployments. So it's quite a big stack. Just a, a quick slide for those of you that aren't familiar with the product. If you interact with our websites, you are interacting ultimately with OpenStack. Um, at any given time. So this isn't, this isn't a science project, although some of the science projects are very impressive. Uh, <laughs> it, it really is what, what generates our revenue, uh, and it has been a, a game changer for us uh, as an organization. Um, there's still a few things that we're, that we're migrating across, mostly the legacy backlog that you get within any organization, and if you're an emerged organization, you get even more legacy backlog um, because you have two sets of things that no one wants to switch off because they're not sure if anyone's using them. At a high level, this is just some of the technologies that our, our software developers use on a daily basis, and as you can imagine, this is constantly changing. 
Um, there's, there's various relational databases, NoSQL. Um, increasingly, we're seeing uh, messaging architectures, streaming uh, as a way of removing dependencies on single data sources. This, as a team, we have, and, and nor should we have, any control over. The, the, the software developers will use the right tool to meet the product requirements that, that they're solving. Our job is to make this as seamless as possible for them to deploy it onto production um, and in a resilient and, and scalable manner. Um, it, it, it's a bit scary at times because the, the, the pace of change is very, very fast indeed. High level, this is from our reference. Um, architecture that we published about four years ago. It's um, in the public domain. Uh, it's a high-level view of how we've built our cloud. Um, one of the key things is that this is mirrored. There's two data centers, which gives us a sort of live disaster recovery scenario. Um, at any given time, we can move traffic between one data center and the other, and that's been key to the success of the product from, a, from an enterprise perspective. It brings immediate value. Um, to, to the company from a financial perspective. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, but it, there are people you can ask around if anyone's interested in this. It is, it is you can look, at it, look it up, uh, and I will be uploading the slides as a PDF um, as soon as I get the instructions on how to. <laughs> right. We first built our OpenStack Cloud with a small, well, the number of third-party consultants came and helped us. Um, we use a, a distribution, um, and Red Hat sent some consultants in to, to help us set it up. Um, over time, we, we ended up building a small team of OpenStack aware people. Some, some were graduates, some were experts we brought in externally. Um, and you'll see a number of presentations actually historically over over the various OpenStack conferences. There's one about a trilogy comparing the cost of an OpenStack cloud with an AWS cloud, um, run by uh, OVH and a couple of other guys. It's, it's worth a look. Um, it, it's good value, but they all use a team of six people, 24-7, maintaining their, their OpenStack cloud. And this is, this is how we originally did it. We had the Probably, I mean, six is the number. We had six headcount. There was never actually six people at any given time in that team that, that were building it. And what, what we found happened was, was, was this. Um, they, it's possible to build a cloud as soon as you have to maintain that 24-7 with 1,000 hypervisors and two data centers and all the other complexity um, we showed on, on that chart is that the small issues, the, the, the hardware issues that, that invariably happen become an enormous drain on people's time. And what we wanted from, from, from that team um, was for them to drive forward, to look at how we would upgrade, um, how we would improve things, what other things we could do, what other projects we could make use of, rather than the ones we just started with. We wanted to continue exploring what OpenStack could bring. And while they were drowning under a sea of tickets, uh, that, that was never going to be possible. And I've got a rough visualization of our pager duty calls over time. Um, and you can see at, well, at one stage we were answering the phone the entire time. Of late, it has been significantly better. Uh, and, and that's been down to the approach we took of trying to separate this, the responsibilities. Uh, now, it, it's, not been, it's not been without its challenges, and I think Adrian will talk to you about some of them. But, but what essentially we did in summary um, was that we created, we split two teams, and we asked the, the guys who had traditionally been running the um, the legacy infrastructure, I think they've been variously branded as IT platforms and infrastructure engineering and various other, other names over time. We asked them to come on board and, and help us out. And um, I think Andrew's going to talk to you about um, the details of that. Uh, the quote from DevOps Borat is a nice one that you get lots of teams of one. Um, but the, the key thing of a team is that we work together and across teams that can be tricky. Yeah, so to make this a success, we've implemented a, sing, a, a, ways of, a new ways of working in our infrastructure by doing sprints. Um, and one of my guys, for example, is working really close with uh, Thomas' teams in order to make this happen. Um, obviously, another few guys will join uh, their sprints in order to bring all the knowledge and all the operational stuff into our area to 
give them time to focus on, on, on continue, to continue the project and give us enough time and knowledge to continue the operational work. And that's been said. Um, I'm going to present a um, single pane of, of glass in terms of storage, what we have behind us in the OpenStack, and how we monitor uh, the storage uh, uh, behind the OpenStack. Um, and again, this is a single pane of glass. Uh, we have like multiple devices. Uh, why we choose to have this model? Because uh, it's really easy to operate with them. It's it, it really easy to maintain them. It's really easy to upgrade them. Um, and also we segregate environments, production from non-production uh, zones. Uh, we also implemented synchronization between devices, so if you want to migrate from a device to another, obviously it's, it's straightforward to do synchronization at the volume level. And yeah, they are mapped through Cinder to our VMs in OpenStack, so um, this is our single pane of glass in terms of storage. Right. So having, having described a single pane of glass in terms of storage, one thing we don't have and I would recommend that anyone that's running their own um, cloud does have is, is an overview of, of what your consumption rate is, what your capacity is, what your usage is. And that's something that we haven't had and we still don't have. I'm going to talk very briefly about um, a, a, a solution we've put in place. But as I go through it, I think you'll see that it's not optimal. And as, as we start looking at including other clouds into our tooling and our, the supply that we offer, I think it's going to be increasingly important that we not end up with a separate way of managing, operating, reporting on each of the clouds that we use, which is the way the model is currently looking. Um, what we have here is a, a rough little design of how we have pulled out information of our consumption of our OpenStack cloud in order to make a, a visible dashboard for people to, to, to monitor and look at. This is essentially for our 24-7 operations teams, but also for those looking to see and make purchasing decisions about further hardware that we want to integrate and add into our cloud. Um, essentially, it, it pulls out what well, is based on an Ansible module written in Python, uses the OpenStack SDK library, and it hits the, um, the under cloud and the over cloud to, to pull out information. It then ships that information in a predefined format, um, a JSON format, um, to Splunk, which is a log monitoring solution. Uh, this is an interesting concept. But um, it can't, Splunk does have reasonable dashboarding um, capabilities. And if we get time, we'll, um, we'll touch on them in a second. But this runs on a 24-hour session. This isn't live monitoring of your usage. This is simply what is allocated in terms of resources in your cloud so that we can have a little bit of understanding of what's going to happen next. Because with the model, the CICD model we have and the independence we give our software developers, they could at any time simply configure an extra 100 VMs on their, um, on their infrastructure for their application and try and deploy it. And the last thing you want is a broken deployment midway through because you don't have enough compute to offer um, the, the, the tooling, which, which has happened. Um, so I'll, um, that's not meant to be um, legible. <laughs> I can see people squinting. If we get time at the end, I can open up the dashboards and just go through exactly what they're showing you from our two different clouds, our different data centers, uh, in, in terms of the visibility that it gives us. But, but to repeat, this, this, isn't, this is a stopgap solution for us, and the fact that OpenStack gives you these APIs that you can trawl and do what you want with helps us out of the hole, but I would strongly recommend you go and look at the various sets of tooling that will give you uh, visibility into what you're doing and where you're going. I think we, we approached it as an afterthought and that was probably a, a mistake. Um, and there's also a blog post um, that I might share afterwards about how we've done built that lightweight reporting platform. Right, so we, I think this is gonna be for you, Adrian, right? So we, <laughs> we um, the infrastructure's across two data centers, and we, we built everything in a, in a, with an immutable design. So when we do our deployments, we rebuild everything from scratch, and this, this hasn't been without its challenges, nor has running a physical infrastructure. Yeah, and yeah, we, we, we had a lot of issues, I, I need to be honest with you. Um, MLAG issues, uh, storage expansion, uh, firmware patching, uh, and, and 
Thomas mentioned that we have an active active data center, so we could uh, fix this in multiple ways by m moving the, the traffic in a single data center and replace all the hardware or all the issues that we had in, a diff in, in the second one. But again, because we were just before the Cheltenham and, and, and Grand National this year, before the spring racing, we couldn't do that. And we decided, for, for example, for the battery replacement, we decided to do that in batches. Um, and yeah, we have immutable environment, as uh, Thomas mentioned. And in terms of, so we keep the, the VMs on the local storage, on the, uh, on the uh, hypervisors, and in case of a failure, we give to the developers a uh, spare hypervisor in order, in order to deploy their TLAs or their uh, microservices onto them. Um, Yeah, we, we also had like CPU spikes uh, on our hypervisors. We raised cases with the guys uh, from Red Hat. Uh, they gave us a lot of hints and they helped us a lot uh, in there. Um, yeah, also we tackled down the meltdown and Spectre vulner vulnerabilities by applying all the patches uh, through all our infrastructure. Uh, and as I said, we can do it like moving the traffic in a single data center, apply everything uh, in the second one and move the traffic back and take care of the other one. So we can do in multiple ways. Um, I'm going to talk about the migration from Kilo to Neutron, which is ongoing at the moment together with the guys from Thomas team. Um, so the process is extremely simple. Uh, we take the hardware from OSP7, we review the hardware, uh, uh, Kilo, sorry, no, not OSP7. Um, yeah, so we take the hardware from, from Kilo, uh, we review the hardware, we put it in, uh, in Newton, and using the pipelines, uh, everything is done actually through the pipelines. We have like six steps to do that, to cover, and the pipeline was written by uh, project, project team. Um, how we do that? Um, so we create the goal structure. Um, create the goal structure by down, downloading all the requirements uh, and preparing the migration. The second step is to create virtual environments because we, we do have uh, a lot of Python modules and Ansible playbooks. Uh, we need to create those uh, environments. Uh, the third step is to clean up stage. Uh, in this step, we clean clean up the licenses and everything. Oh, sorry, we clean up the we clean up the Nuage licenses and um, all the monitoring from uh, Kilo, and we prepare. Actually, we in, in the next step we load the profile, which means that we have two types of profiles: application and database and it depends which type of migration is. If it's a database, obviously, it will be a, a profile of database. And yeah, we take the, the next step, which is tenant preparation, and the final stage is to have that specific hypervisor migrated in the new world, which is Newton. Okay, um, in terms of operational excellence, uh, the guys integrated like everything with Slack, uh, PagerDuty. Uh, we, we use Sensor for monitoring the, our infrastructure. And again, with, with PagerDuty, as I mentioned. And I can do a short demo uh, just to show you exactly. Sorry. So what are we demoing here, Adrian? So I'm going to simulate uh, one of the hypervisor failures. So I'm going to reboot one of the hypervisors. Is this a production hypervisor, Adrian? Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a change, Thomas. <laughs> OK, so that hypervisor is down now, so we have to wait like another one minute and a half in order to receive a call in page duty. Um, meanwhile, we can, I know, take any questions if you want to. It doesn't look like it. 
think one of the things one of the things that we skipped over earlier was that the that CD Go pipeline that you saw Adrian um, talking about is almost identical to the ones that we use for deploying um, the applications that the software developers use. So that there are different, additional different steps, but the interface is the same. Um, the level of automation is by design. Uh, we we want to interact with our infrastructure via Git and configuration changes and then triggering pipelines that apply them. The, the, the repeatability, the immutability um, are, are key for us. Um, there, should be no, there should be no pets. It's, it's cattle by design. And we're waiting for our page of duty call. Yeah. And I've sure. never anticipated a page of duty call with so much. Yeah, the server should go down in a bit. I can do a hard stop anyway. <coughs> Still waiting for Pedro to call me. <laughs> Give it a minute and skip it if, yeah. if we need to. But. Set the demo yeah. grid, so again. <laughs> One second. <coughs> yeah, I just received the. Okay, so we have received the. Yeah, we see, received the alert on Slack, as you can see in here for that specific server. <clears throat> and I'm waiting for Page Duty to call me in a bit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Did you hang up on Page Duty? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I acknowledge the, the 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 check. And obviously now what I can do, I can check exactly what instances do we have running on this specific hypervisor to make the developers aware that their VMs are not running anymore. And what the decision we should take. So if we have like, if we have um, a hypervisor failure and we need to replace the hypervisor, we just take one of the, from the spares, we give them the spare. Uh, they are allowed to deploy any time the microservices in production, and we can take this uh, hypervisor that that failed, um, and I know investigate, replace the failed parts, engage the guys from. Um, hi, Andre. <laughs> so we we can take we can we can engage the guys from data center in order to replace that those failed parts. So Adrian. It if, if I'm a software developer and my VM has suddenly disappeared because of this hardware failure, have yeah. I also received a page of duty call? Yeah, you receive the page of duty call, you are, you are notice, uh, and also you, are, you should be actually on, on, on our Slack channel together with us, okay. and we will continue the investigation, and we will decide together if we need to give you a spare one or not. Okay, to deploy so, your so in this instance, we see Andre has just joined the, um, the Slack channel. Are, are you able, and he needs 
he needs a hyper he needs the hypervisor back. Yeah. What would be the process for getting um, Andre his hypervisor back? So there's a pipeline in place. So right once we take this out from the from the from the from the production environment, we give him a spare. We tell him exactly which is the new hypervisor, and he is able actually to he will be able actually to deploy his uh, TLAs onto to, onto that hypervisor. And all of this would be via the the GoCD pipelines that you showed yeah. us earlier. Yeah, everything will be done through CI/CD that we have in place. For the demo, are you going to do any of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going. No, I'm going to log into uh, our OpenStack and check exactly what VMs do we have, what instances do we have on that specific hypervisor. So you will see all the insta instances that are shut off actually on this specific hypervisor. As I mentioned, the inst instances are, ho are hosted on, uh, locally on the hypervisor. And again, by giving them a, a spare hypervisor, they will be able to destroy these VMs and uh, create a new ones on the new hypervisor. And yeah, that's Thank you. That's it. So how are we doing for time? We are a little bit ahead of time, but um, I think, is there a Q&A slide that we can put up <laughs> in the hope of prompting some questions? Yeah. Any questions about how we're doing the day-to-day -day managing of our, of our cloud? So, so the, the question is, how do we do the upgrade from um, Kilo to Newton or OSP7 to OSP10? So uh, we've actually leveraged the, um, the immutable model that, that I described, and we have, I think we touched on it with the, with the pipeline that you saw there, but effectively we've, we've built from scratch uh, each tenant in OSP10, and then we have asked the software development teams to change one entry in their YAML file, which is the name of the cloud, so it goes from being OSP7 to OSP10, and then they redeploy. Um, and it's, we have a 30-day redeploy policy, so in order to avoid needing to, to do patches or, of OSs, we ask them to redeploy every 30 days, which means they pick up um, a patched image every 30 days. We've actually had to accelerate that somewhat because you can see it's quite a wasteful use of hardware to have everything running in duplicate um, at their level. But we have then gone out to them and said, could you please, in the next week, redeploy all your applications? It's been extremely seamless. They have the applications have spun up in, in the, the second cloud. Um, it does mean that we're effectively running two clouds until we've managed to get everyone to go through that process. But it, so it, it hasn't been in place. And it's been, um, it, it's been a, a redeploy from scratch. But the config means that our Git config is entirely accurate. And um, I think OVH, at one of the keystones, um, uh, Keynotes were saying that they'd spent um, a year doing R&D and then four hours doing their upgrade. Ours has been similar. There's been a, about a year design, testing, um, and then it's not been four hours because it isn't us effectively doing the upgrade. It is, it is the teams, and we have this Tetris of bringing hypervisors in and out of one cloud. But it, but it has been reasonably seamless. A few permissions differences and a few extra bits we did, like changing the LDAP groups, which have caused people some issues, but the actual um, Kilo to Newton upgrade uh, has been surprisingly um, issue-free. Anybody else? The question was, do the developers have control of the compute nodes on which their applications are running because we described it as them redeploying onto the spare node? Um, yes and no. Uh, I think we slightly led you astray with the, with, by saying they deploy onto the spare node. They would redeploy their application, and if it was a pooled tenant, then they would end up, some of them would, if, if Nova's scheduling 
um, as expected, they would end up on the, on the spare node. Some are pinned, some, some um, to avoid um, CPU contention uh, and noisy neighbors, etc. Some have pinned onto specific um, hypervisors, and then we would tell them what the new one is, and they would change their YAML to pin to the new one and, there, and then redeploy. Often those are the heavier, more stateful applications. Anybody else? So? Um, wondering on the single pane of glass view for your monitoring, how do you determine like what are those things that you want to monitor? Because we also are in a similar situation and we're, we kind of wonder like what are the most important metrics that you're watching and kind of monitoring and how do you, how do you set up that single pane of glass view? Yeah, so how did we define what's in the single pane of glass view? Um, time and experience. People are asking us questions that we couldn't answer. Um, effectively, it has been, has been that. So we, as people have come to us and said, I'm running out of, of compute in my tenant. Can I have, can I have more hypervisors? Um, we've also, so I think I, I, we showed the Splunk-based ones, but there are also, we have um, a, a TSDB instance recording actual usage, uh, both at the VM and the hypervisor level. So we've been trying to use that to, first of all, look at how allocated the tenants are. We get that from, um, from, from OpenStack and, and into Splunk. But then we go back and we say, well, actually, you're, you're, you, you, know, you, you claim to be having a three to one contention ratio, but you're only ever using 10% of the CPU and the hypervisor. Can we look at how you've configured your application uh, in an attempt to, you know, I mean, minimizing cost is it, it, in the enterprise world a, a key thing. So there is that in the storage as well. We found that we had um, given the developers free reign and they had uh, overcommitted the storage to quite a terrifying ratio um, and we had to go back and work out what they were actually using because and, and I've, I've, you know, I've done this myself as a software developer if someone gives you free reign on how you specify your infrastructure you are going to bulletproof it because you don't want to be phoned on a Saturday and you don't want your customers to be impacted so there is a balance there but, but we didn't have a methodology we've rather done it by trial and error um, and yeah, for, from the storage perspective, to protect ourselves, obviously, we added uh, uh, QoS and also, uh, it, yeah, to, to, I don't know, in order to protect, as I mentioned, ourselves from, from, from the capacity perspective, uh, we decided to split those in multiple, and we have the view exactly what's running on each device, as I, I showed you in, in the single pane of glass. Anybody else? In which case, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.